With everything happening in the world, we couldn't leave you hanging without a weekly edition of Submission Radio. This man here is a legend when it comes to MMA coverage, causing bottlers to run out of supply long before supermarkets and their toilet paper. <laughs> the man in, his, in blue joins us here in a black polo. A new look for the legend himself, John Morgan. Welcome to Submission Radio. Great to have you, man. Hey, man, I'm just thankful the liquor stores are staying open here in Las Vegas, man. It's, it's keeping my sanity about me, you know what I'm saying? Just curious, how, how have you been handling this whole, before we talk about the massive news of, of, of the week and last week, how have you been handling this whole coronavirus disaster? And by the way, just quickly, for anyone joining us on video, uh, the, the stuff around my eyes, don't worry, it's not coronavirus. It's, uh, it's far, far worse. Kills you six times as quicker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, you know what? Listen, um, it's it's wild. I mean, listen, this is a, a weird time for everybody, right? I mean, we're all getting used to this stuff. And I mean, you know, I, I guess there's been a little bit of benefit. I mean, slowing down life a little bit, kind of put a pause on things is, isn't the worst thing ever. I mean, kind of, you know, I've been with my wife and my son, which is phenomenal. You know, my thank, thankfully, my wife is an absolute stud. You know, she's helping <laughs> take care of my son and, and, and the education that that's going on and, and all those things. So, I mean, she's she's holding things together. So shout out to her for doing that. Um, it's, it's wild, man. I mean, I'm not. I'm not going, you know, completely uh, stir crazy yet. Being cooped up in here. Fortunately, I got a, a house that I love and a family I'm cool with. But uh, man, <laughs> cool I, I don't know. Is the, is the day? <laughs> you know, yeah, some right. people probably are. Let's be honest. There's probably yeah. some people like, oh, I hate this woman. Yeah. Uh, but no, you know, uh, as the days and the weeks go on, man, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, I'm definitely. It's weird to look on the calendar, and I think that's probably the weirdest part is, you know, I've had some stretches where, I, where I'm at home for a little while, but there's always something on the calendar that I know is there and that I know I'm looking forward to. And, and man, like, you know, I should be telling you guys, hey, man, can't wait to see you in Perth. Yeah. But do I know if that's going to happen? I mean, who knows? You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a weird time. Yeah, absolutely crazy times. And let's kick it off with the first big news of the week, and that is Khabib. Possibly being stuck in Russia, not being able to travel to any location for this Tony Ferguson fight, UFC 249. He said it pretty well when he said that he's training and preparing every day. But I don't know what I'm preparing for. For what fight? What was your reaction when you saw this and the fact that, I mean, you, ca you can't say that it's the UFC's fault that this happened. But it was sort of based on some of the advice they gave him in terms of the fight possibly happening overseas. Well, I mean, clearly the UFC created the coronavirus by even trying to book this fight again. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want it to happen. Stop booking this damn fight. Uh, now, now, you know, listen, um, it's, it's such a weird situation, right? Because on the one hand, like, I, I do, I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I do applaud the UFC for trying to figure out a way to continue on. I mean, uh, the way I look at things is, is you know, the, the, the world, this, this, this disease, you know, this virus is not going away. Now, I'm not saying... We necessarily need to hold an event on April 18th. I don't know what the world is going to look like then, um, but but we do have to figure out some way to keep operating safely. I mean, there need to be changes made. You know, I've been thinking, hey, how do we do media days differently? How do we do weigh-in days differently? You know, the submission underground uh, event that Chael Sonnen did, the, the way things were set up there was was wild to see. I mean, nice there us. are probably going to be changes we have to implement moving forward. So I, I applaud them, but it's weird too, man. I feel like, you know, uh, trying to put this together right now just with the way things are changing the government regulations and you know how things switch on a moment's notice i i just don't know how practical it is to, to try to make anything happen on, on april the 18th and um i don't know it's just a damn shame you know habib flying to to, to abu dhabi and then russia and, and, and all around and i mean who knows what what tony ferguson i mean we know he can come up with some pretty creative workouts all by himself mm. but um, it's just a, it's a weird, weird situation right now. It's funny, like from an anecdotal perspective, like, you know, send me location, like you can send him any location. He just can't necessarily travel there. Here's my perspective, right? And this is the big question for me. Should the UFC had seen this coming? Because, you know, travel bans and lockdowns are obviously only getting increasingly worse all over the world. And, you know, given the fluidity of this event's location, do you think that maybe the UFC should have steered away from confirming to Khabib that, hey, this is 100% not going to be in the UFC? US, should they maybe have you know le left it open and by the way that's just Khabib's side that's just what he's saying you know maybe there's another side to the story but I just feel like ruling out any part of the world would have been kind of silly uh, to say to Khabib yeah I, I kind of agree as well I mean especially knowing that he was here in the United States training at one yeah. point uh, you know I 
the way I look at it is this. I mean, you know, people keep asking me. I mean, people within the industry, uh, our own staff, you know, hey, man, what do you think about April 18th? Does it happen? Does it not happen? I mean, I, I would not put anything past uh, Dana White. I mean, there is no question how determined he is. He has made it clear he is determined to make something happen. And so, you know, can he figure something out? You know, maybe so. But I tend to think if it happens, you know, a lot of people in, in the beginning were saying, oh, I bet Abu Dhabi. And, and I kind of understood that. You know, obviously, they've got a great relationship with the government there in Abu Dhabi. But um, to me, I think if it's going to happen, it, it's probably going to to be domestic here in the United States because because of all these travel bans and you can't control what other countries are going to do, other foreign governments and that sort of thing. So, I mean, if something does happen, it seems to me it would happen here. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, if you should say they should have had the foresight because I'll be honest, man, the way this thing changes every single day, I mean, it, it, you know, there was a time, you know, right before they canceled the events that I thought, man, they're going to find a way to do this. You know, here in Nevada, we hadn't closed schools yet. We hadn't closed the Las Vegas Strip yet. And I was, you know, I was saying to even our own team, I'm like, dude, come on, man. Like, if if everything is still operating at 100% here, you're telling me they're not going to get, you know, an event done at the UFC Apex? Come on. And then obviously in, in, in the blink, you know, our governor here in Nevada came out and said, look, the Las Vegas Strip is closed. Um, and, when, you know, when that happened, when I asked, you know, the, the, the lifeblood of our community here financially, when the governor was willing to say, we're shutting it all down, I said, oh, man, never mind. You know, this thing is, is way, way different. So, you know, I, I'd hate to say they didn't have the foresight. I just don't think anybody really understood the gravity of what we were going to be facing, man. Mm. And now the UFC is looking at a replacement for Tony Ferguson. Some people are saying, you know, it could be a guy like Justin Gaethje. Then you see you see John Kavanagh's all over Twitter. Oh, there could be a third option. And, you know, just like, don't tease us, John. All right. Don't tease us like that. It's a tough time for us all. I mean, do you think it's worth it, considering that if Justin wins, we may never see this Tony Khabib thing actually happen? And even if it did go down, if it, even if it did happen, you know, it's nowhere near as important as this sort of big Tony Ferguson fight that so many people have been looking forward to with Khabib. Yeah, John Cameron I likes to wind people up a little bit. Oh, I mean, yeah. I saw that. That's pretty great. But, um, yeah, no, you know what? I, I'll be honest with you. I'm a, you know, I understand the USC's desire to, to push forward with an event. And, um, you know, I can appreciate what they're trying to do. But um, if you can't get the fight that you're looking for, uh, I, I don't know that you break up the fight. I mean, we all want to see Habib and Tony Ferguson, right? I yeah. mean, th that doesn't answer the questions. If if it's Tony Ferguson and Justin Gaethje, don't get me wrong, great fight. Yeah. Love it. You know what I mean? I, I'm excited about it. But that's not the fight we want to see, you know? So, uh, but, you know, on the other hand, too, listen, uh, Tony Ferguson has a family to feed. And, and, and if he's saying, look, um, I, you know, I've been preparing. I thought I was getting ready for Habib. And, and, and now, you know, you're going to pull this away from me. And then let's not forget Again, this thing changes all the time. Now, of course, we know Habib has Ramadan to worry about, so that rules out a little bit of a time period. Um, but at the same time, man, we don't know. Like I'm saying, I, are we going to Perth? I don't I don't know. I mean, who knows what is going to change in this world? So, you know, I can understand, and I haven't heard anything from Tony. So I, I reached out to Tony, um, but, you know, they're, they're kind of keeping him uh, without doing much media right now. Um, but I could kind of understand if he's like, look, just get me somebody. You know, I'm prepared and I'm ready to fight. So I could understand it. For me personally, it's not the fight I want to see. But from the UFC and from Tony Ferguson's perspective, I get it. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's annoying also because, like, if Tony wins, it's just a hypothetical. Like, what does he really gain? Like, you can't really look at him and be like, oh, well, now he's even more deserving to fight Khabib. He's already, like, as deserving as it gets to fight Khabib. It doesn't do anything other than adding, you know, Justin Gaethje to his record, which is obviously a big scalp. And then if Justin wins, well, it, it fucks up the fight that we all wanted, you know, this whole time. But here's the other thing, John. Like, Justin Gaethje sort of notorious for not accepting fights on short notice, which is completely fair and understandable. And here he is having like two weeks notice. And last year he didn't take a fight against Tony Ferguson because four weeks was not long enough for him to prepare. So how likely do you think it is, you know, that we even get Justin Gaethje versus Tony Ferguson? And also, even if we do, I, I know like in theory, if the fight happened, it'd be great no matter what, right? But this is, this is going to be a much, uh, much lesser version of what this fight could be if you're getting a Justin Gaethje who hasn't had full time to prepare. And you're also getting Tony Ferguson, who, as creative as he is, probably hasn't had the ideal training camp as well. Yeah, that's the one thing that's been coming up to me. You hit the nail on the head there with Justin Gaethje. I mean, he's always made it very clear, like, I don't take short notice mm -hmm. fights. It's not good for me. I need eight weeks. So that kind of makes me wonder, like, is he willing to step in here and do that? But again, I mean, this is such a weird and desperate time, man. I mean, it, you know, maybe... 
you know, Gaethje feels like some sense of community to, to MMA fans. Or again, maybe he wants to bank a paycheck before who knows what happens. I mean, you know, what, what if regulations get tighter? What if, you know, things just get more and more impossible? So, I mean, I think this is if, if ever there was somebody to act uh, a time for somebody to act out of character, this might be it. So, you know, I wouldn't instantly say like, yep, Gaethje's a lock. But I mean, at this point right now to me, man, it seems like all bets are off. This is, again, such a weird and unique situation. Mm. Interesting because obviously Ali manages both him and Khabib, so that must yeah. be an interesting situation from that perspective. But if you're just in Gaethje, you're looking at this Tony Ferguson fight possibly ha- happening, or possibly a fight with Conor McGregor down the line, mm. where he's going to make a lot more money and it's going to be a much bigger sort of pay per view fight. W- what do you do in his situation if you're just in Gaethje and you're looking at well, the amount of money that he could make down the line compared to right now? Well, again, here's so here's the other that's funny. You hit the th- the thing there with Ali Abdelaziz, the the, the uh, connection there as well. So that's the other wild card, right? Where he, we know Justin Gaethje doesn't take short notice fights, but what if I don't know two or three weeks ago Ali was saying, "Bro, I'm just telling you, this is not looking too good right now. You yeah. might want to just start hit, hitting the bags a little bit, if you know what I'm saying." So, <laughs> I mean, there's all kind of things that could be going on behind the scenes. Uh, for me, man, right now, listen, if if I knew for sure that April 18th was happening. Um, and I knew for sure that there was a possibility to get in that fight. If I was advising Justin Gaethje, I mean, yes, you, you know, I've heard all the rumors as well. You know, I've, I've heard the connection to the Conor McGregor fight, international fight. We definitely understand um, that seems to be a very, very likely possibility. But again, if you know you can step into the cage on April 18th and you can and you can cash a check, if I was advising him, I'd say go for it because, dude, I don't know. I have no idea what the world is going to look like on July 11th. I don't even know what it's going to look like on April 11th. I don't even know what it's going to look like tomorrow, man. I mean, that's the, that's how crazy things are, are at these times. So to me, even though Justin Gaethje doesn't like to take short notice fights, if it was me and he was calling me up for advice, I'd say, man, t- take the bird in the hand right now. You know, the two in the bush. You don't know if that's going to be there or not. Mm. Here's the other thing. Like, if Khabib is out... <laughs> What, what, what an absolute shit show, because if you don't have Khabib, then you don't have the title on the line anymore, and we know how much the UFC likes to have titles on the line in the main event, so w- what do you think they do? do you, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got Usman and Masvidal talking, you've got Woodley and Covington talking. If if we even get, say, Tony Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje, do you think the UFC throws some kind of interim title or something in there? Do you think maybe somebody else main events instead and those guys get relegated to, to co-main event? I feel like at this point, the only two people I've really heard that are like, yeah, I want to fight, it's Tony Ferguson and Francis Ngannou, and they're going to be facing off on April 18th. <laughs> <laughs> the UFC are like, ah, fuck it, we did it for the fans. It's the heavyweight title on the line. We're doing, no, I mean, oh, yeah. listen, yeah, they can do anything they want, right? They could, they could strip Habib and be like, bro, Habib's, uh, you know, not willing to, to defy the Russian government, so he's not any <laughs> kind of champion to me. Yeah. No, they, you know, uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm sure they would put an interim title on the line. You know, if, 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 uh, you know, you see, uh, like you said, the other people raising their hand in the air. I mean, who knows what they can pull together? Um, I think you, you, you'd probably put an interim title on the line, and, and, I mean. <laughs> I hate it when that happens because it really doesn't mean anything. Like, all it means is, like, hey, you're the definite number one contender. Especially with but, Tony. Uh, like, oh, another interim yeah. title. Great. Yeah, I'm sure he could show up with his belt already. With and then two. now I get my second interim title belt, yeah. like the double-double interim champ or whatever. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's crazy. But I, I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would come up with an interim title just so there's gold. They, 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 they like to put the gold on the poster. There's no question about it. Mm. We saw DC do this, but I feel like you're the man to really ask this lineup question. That is... If you could have a fantasy lineup for UFC 249 on April 18th, what would the main event card look like for you, John? Oh, man, that's crazy, man. Yeah, if I could have a fantasy, like I'd like Habib versus Tony Ferguson. That's the fight I want to see, man. And that's my fantasy. Like COVID-19 goes the hell away and we get the fight card we were supposed to get. Um, no, I, you know, I don't know. I, dude, I, I, man, I hope Nagano, I mean, knowing how ready he's, he's staying ready, I mean, I'd love to see him on there. Uh, that fight with Jairzinho, I mean, uh, kudos to Nagano for taking that fight, you know, because obviously Jairzinho is kind of the hot commodity, but he's certainly way down in the rankings way mm-hmm. early in his career. So, I, you know, I think for Nagano to take that fight, you know, I, I think that's awesome. Um, it, it would be kind of cool, you know, you see the rumblings of Usman Masvidal, and it doesn't doesn't necessarily seem like it'll come together, but they were talking. I love that. Give me Cejudo versus somebody. You know, Joanne Calderwood's got to wait on yep. Shevchenko now. Maybe yes. maybe Calderwood Cejudo is there. That'll go. We'll do that one. Uh, yeah, just honestly, at this point, just grab anybody. I need fights. I need fights in my life, man. I, I watched 
I, I, I'm, I'm not shitting you guys. I watched a, a video game uh, uh, indie race the other day. Did wow. you see this? Where, where race car drivers were driving simulators in their home. <laughs> I watched the whole... I'm, I'm not even a fan of motorsports. I don't watch <laughs> racing normally. It was the only thing... Going, and it was the most boring race ever. The guy led it from start to finish. But yeah. I watched every minute of it. I need sports. So my fantasy lineup includes... You know, two dudes you pick off the street corner, they test it clean for COVID-19, and they're ready to fight. Just give me those two and, and stick a camera, one camera on a pole, nobody around there. <laughs> Just give me a fight. Give me a fight. Jesus. John Morgan's slow descent into insanity amid this COVID-19. <laughs> At this point, you're going to be driving around, you know, drunk on the streets, firing guns in the air, John. Jesus. Now, but we'll, we'll, By the we'll... way, did I, did I say I was doing good with this? I changed my mind. I'm not doing good with this. <laughs> I'm so crazy. This thing is not good. My wife and kid are driving me nuts. I gotta get out of the house and watch some fun. Excellent. We, <laughs> we, 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 we got, Yeah, we broke him. We got there. Like 15 <laughs> minutes in, we, we got the truth. I'm just wondering, John, what, what do you th And I think that's probably the reason why Dana White wants to do these fights. A, I, I think because of Endeavor's, uh, you know, credit situation, a financial situation. And I think they're sort of leaning on the UFC to put some money in, in, in the bags. And I think also because there's really nothing else. And I think that Dana White sees this as an opportunity to like, hey, if no one's watching anything and that we have this fight, people have to tune in, right? The whole world has to tune in. And I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, but here's the other thing. Luke Thomas was talking on his show about how like, yeah, when you when you have like groups of people hanging out, they're more likely to buy pay-per-views because everybody can say split the cost. You know, 50 bucks, you know, is like $5 between 10 people. But now there's no groups. You can't hang out in groups. So do you think that that affects the pay-per-view numbers anyway? And the, the pay-per-view buys for this event, if it even happens, uh, you know, maybe maybe underwhelming compared to even what the UFC expects. It's tough, right? Because on the one hand, uh, people are starved for entertainment, man. They're starved for some kind of sport. So, you know, you would have the spotlight all to yourself. But on the other hand, man, especially as you can imagine here in Las Vegas, and I know we're not the only community. I mean, it's all over the world. But, I mean, our, our community has been hit hard. I mean, the Las Vegas Strip shuts down. I mean, again, the lifeblood of our community, a lot of people that, that we know, you know, here in the, in, in the community don't have jobs, don't have any income coming in. So, you know, people at the very least, you know, they're tightening up the purse strings a little bit while other people are just downright scrambling to, to, to find a way to pay the bills. Um, so, yeah, you're right. I think, you know, even though you could say, oh, we've got the whole world, you know, the eyes on us. You know, I don't know how many are available to actually, you know, dig into their pockets and come up with 50 bucks. Um, so it's it's an interesting question to ask. You know, I don't think this would be just like the the, the biggest pay per view in the history of the world because nobody else has anything to do. I mean, uh, you know, from what I understand, you know, a lot of the the uh, direct uh, the movies that were supposed to be in movie theaters are coming out like direct to consumer, and they're not exactly doing gangbuster numbers, which you would mm. think, oh man, these movies, you know, they they, they haven't even been in the theaters yet, and it's not really working. So, um, I you know, I look, I do think the finances of it have a, a lot to do with it. I mean, I, I think. Um, you know, Dana White just doesn't like to be told, no, he can't do something. I think he's taking this almost as a personal challenge. I will say this. I do believe that the UFC is set up to recover quicker than most other major sports. I mean, it, it doesn't take I mean, any other sport you come to. I mean, it's two teams. It does take a group of, of, of people to get on a field together. You know, here uh, we are talking about a much smaller, uh, you know, exposure between fighters. I mean, yes, you got the cornermen as well. Um, again, I, I go back to that, uh, the, the, the Chael Sun and Submission Underground event. It was interesting to watch. I mean, the referee, now it's grappling, not, not MMA, but the referee was, was staying six feet away at all times. Um, the competitors actually touched elbows to start, which was kind of funny because then they were yes. grappling with each other. But, but it was yeah. funny to see. They were forced to wear, uh, you know, rash guards and full spats as well. I don't think you could do that in MMA. Um, but, you know, listen, I, it would not shock me uh, if, you know, say the rest of this year, uh, there are no public uh, public gatherings of, at sports. You know, if everything has to be behind closed doors. Um, you know, I, I don't know if April 18th is the time to, to try to carry forward with an event. Again, things are changing quickly. But I do think the UFC, especially with the Apex um, is set up to get going faster than, than other major sports. I mean, once they decide it's okay to go, I, I think it's going to be a little bit easier. They have the facility right there ready to go. It takes a lot less people involved. You know, you don't have to have a crowd. You can have minimal crews, um, or, you know, remote cameras, that sort of thing. And, look, ESPN is going to be hurting for content. I know that right now, you know, fighter pay is a big, big discussion out there. And, and I know everybody would love it if the UFC would just cut checks for everybody that's missing fights. I, I, that would be amazing mm. in a perfect world. It's not going to happen, all right? Sorry. It wasn't collectively bargained, and I don't think you can go to anybody and just think, hey, man, my boss sure is nice. They just paid everybody. It's not going to happen. 
But what I do think happening, and Dana White has hinted at it, um, ESPN is desperate for content, man. They, they've got nothing. I mean, you know, they're, they're the ones airing these damn video games and stuff yes. that I'm stuck watching. But, you know, so you're going to be able to do – I think once everything gets going, you're going to have fighters desperate to fight, um, and you're going to have a network desperate for programming. I think, you know, you might see for, you know, six or eight weeks straight, you know, two fight cards a week. Um, maybe or maybe all of them out at the Apex. I mean, maybe you don't travel anywhere. Maybe you cancel your entire traveling schedule and you just do everything at the Apex. Um, it, it would seem to make sense to me, and, 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 man, wouldn't that be paying dividends for the UFC? So, you know, you'd lose all the money that you generated from your live gate. I mean, man, the, the Barclays Center gate, you know, was probably going to be, you know, $10 million plus. Um, that sucks. Uh, but, again, you can start getting that content out and, and start ca uh, cashing those checks from, from the, from the uh, programming that you're putting out there. Yeah, for sure. I keep thinking back to Joanna Yamjachuk's meme, like, well, it feels like a thousand years ago and all the outrage it caused. And now it's like if Dana White tomorrow was like, yeah, yeah, we got it done. Fighters are going to be fighting in hazmat suits. It's like memes coming to reality. Okay. Now it's like, you know, all this time later, it, uh, it seems almost like somewhat likely. I will say this, though, John. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, like some of the, the tough times that people are going through. Uh, I want to make a big sort of thank you and a shout out to people at Ridge, ridge.com for supporting us and sponsoring us through this really, really tough time. Um, if you do want to get yourself an awesome wallet, you can go to ridge.com forward slash submission. You get that 10% submission rate of discount. This is my my actual wallet. This is the one that I've had for years and years. Actually, they've sent me an updated version. This one's carbon fiber. Uh, this has all my cards in it. It's very little. It's very streamlined. You can get other ones. You can get titanium. You can get aluminium. There's other funky designs. If you want a colored one, that's fine. It's so little and streamlined, it doesn't feel like you're carrying a massive, you know, black or, or brown leather suitcase in your pocket. Uh, I've taken this overseas. I've taken this to, to Thailand, to Bali, to music festivals. I've taken it to all the biggest events that we've ever covered when we go stateside. You know, Alvarez and McGregor, when McGregor became the, the, the champ, champ at 205. Uh, the Diaz-McGregor rematch, jo John Jones in DC, that rematch. Uh, Whitaker and Adesanya, Khabib and Connor in Vegas, Masvidal and Diaz uh, in New York, and most recently, Connor and Cowboy. Uh, you can get it with this awesome money strap or cash strap so you can put all your notes in there as well. And if you want, you can have a money clip instead so the options and choices are yours. Um, if you don't love it, they do free returns. So there's really no risk. It's a lifetime guarantee. There's over 30,000 five-star reviews and free worldwide shipping and returns. Are you good friends at Ridge? Uh, they have other products as well on their website so you can check that out rich.com forward slash submission for your 10% discount. And just wanted to say a massive, massive thank you to those guys for sticking with us and supporting us through this really, really tough time. But obviously I mentioned a whole bunch of events just there, John. So I did want to ask you one of the most crucial questions as far as this event, UFC 249, where do you think this one might actually take place? Hey man, first, that's cool, man. Hey, you know, it's silly, but sponsors sticking by everybody right now, man. That's cool, dude, because this is tough financial times for everybody. So that's awesome mm. they stuck with you guys through this, man. That shows some real loyalty. Uh, for me, man, listen, first, I would originally I would have said the Apex. Like I said, it seems like it's set up perfectly, um, but our, our governor in Nevada has come out and, and um, you know, basically recommended that everything be shut down through April 30th. Of course, that's the federal guidelines as well. Uh, I, I, I've, I've reached out the Athletic Commission to find out because there is no April meeting. You remember, we had a March 25th meeting where they were going to decide you know when they'd start doing uh, events again um and and that hasn't happened and, and I, they haven't rescheduled it so uh you know listen uh, it sounds like florida is, is a big option right now um so i, I guess if i was gonna have to say somewhere I'd, I'd say florida i think going international is is a little too risky just try i mean things could change in a heartbeat and you can't do anything about it i mean at least domestically uh you know uh, not that you know dana can just call up trump and get travel bans lifted or whatever but at least you have a little bit more heads up of what's going to happen so i'd probably say domestic and, and, I, and i'd probably say florida but i will say this man i i don't know i've, I've had a couple conversations with, with dana white uh behind the scenes over the course of this couple weeks and every time i talk to him he says look i'm gonna get this done i'm gonna get this done and then i ask him well where should i book a ticket to because I, I you know i intend to cover this thing if it happens and uh and then suddenly he stops talking to me so uh, <laughs> i have no idea Best. i have no idea um you know but i I would say it sounds like Florida is the most likely, but who knows, man? Put it on an, an aircraft carrier out in international yeah. waters. Maybe I was thinking, I was thinking you get one of those big transport planes, like C 19s or whatever the hell they're called, that mm. fit like tanks and stuff up in there. You could just be flying up in the middle of the air and do the fight there, man. I, I, I don't know. Just give me something. Tell about yeah. something, please. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if, if Dana White flies up any media to international waters uh, for, on a big boat, I, I'm guessing you would be one of the first people he calls, John, if that makes you feel any better. So, But hey, come on, Dana. Listen, Ghost, ghosting a legend like John Morgan? Unbelievable. Come <laughs> on, man. Listen, I, 
I will say this, you know, I've talked to my employer about it, and as it stands right now, um, if there's a fight on April 18th, I intend to be there. Um, you know, In will person. I take precautions? If, if there's a fight you know, on April 18th, if, 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 if I can be there, if, if media is allowed, you know, if the UFC is going to allow that, uh, I intend to cover in person. I, wow. I, will, I will take added precautions. Uh, I will do all the things that are recommended. Uh, I, I, I will do that, um, but I, I intend to be there. And I, I have said, um, again, as I've been saying this whole time, I mean, the world is changing, um, in, you know, quickly. And if for some reason, you know, on April 15th or April 16th, I look up and, you know, this thing has gotten way past where it is now, then, then maybe I'll change my mind. But as it stands now, if there's a fight on April 18th, I'll be there. Wow. Mm, just, just on that, I mean, that, that's a very – you know, respectable thing that you, you said, John, and it, you know, it's a big statement because I know a lot of media people might have not wanted to do it, but how important would it be for you to actually be at an event like this? I mean, you've covered some of the smallest, biggest, craziest events in MMA history. How important for you would it be, <clears throat> just career-wise, to be at, at, at this event and be able to cover it in a time like this? It's a part of history. Um, and, and whether it's a good part of history or a bad part of history, that's, you know, that's up for the, the future to decide. Um, but I do feel that a big part of our job as journalists is to document the history of a sport. And, uh, this will be an incredibly historical moment. Um, you know, whether or not it's the right idea to, to have these fights or not, I, I guess potentially it's up for debate. Um, I think if things are done, you know, according to guidelines that, that things can happen. Um, I do think that if anybody just says, oh, this is the flu, it's not that big a deal. Come on, man. You know, we've seen the things from all over the world. We, this, this is not the flu. It is serious. Um, but, you know, there are certain guidelines and steps that can be taken. And, um, you know, I'm not quite as cavalier as Dana White is just saying, well, if the corona is going to get me, the corona is going to get me. I mean, mm -hmm. no, I've got, I got a wife and family to support. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I do feel like if you uh, approach it in uh, an intelligent manner, I do feel like, you know, I, I'm not going to be up, uh, you know, I, like I said, I don't want to be in a media scrum with, you know, 30 other cameras, so us all shoulder to shoulder, you know, rubbing against each other for, you know, sweating for space. But, you know, can we spread out a little bit? Can we do things different? I mean, again, I, I, I just I have to believe there has to be a future. I don't think this thing is going away, man. I don't think us staying in our house until May 1st means we all come out of our houses on May 1st and we, we start hugging and, and clapping and, and hey, we beat it. It's all gone, man. No, it's still going to be there. Um, so I, I think changes are going to have to be made long term to deal with this. And if, if it's not this, if it's not, you know, COVID-19, it opened our eyes to, to something else that may happen. So maybe, the, again, maybe there's a way to change things. So, yeah, overall, it would be important to me, man. I think it's uh, it's it's an opportunity to document history and, um, you know, one way or the other, whether we're on the right side of it or the wrong side of it, um, if it happens, I, I think somebody needs to be there to, 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 to be a journalist in it. Oh, man, that's a very commendable thing. I just got a massive shiver down my spine. Be safe there, mm. John. I want to have beers with you in the future. So <laughs> for, for the love of God, be safe. Dude, I, I was very cavalier about this whole thing. And then I heard about a gentleman who was in a coma uh, because of it. And I thought, oh, yeah, some some old man, probably 35 years old, fitness freak, healthier than all of us put together. And I was like, yeah, uh, this is where I start wearing face masks, where I go to the shops and, uh, and covering up. Uh, but before we let you go, John, obviously wanted to talk about another John uh, as we sort of wrap up. And obviously that was, you know, John Jones being in trouble yet again, another arrest, more traffic violations and offenses. Uh, and obviously as we're talking right now, there has been some breaking news and he has reached a plea bargain a plea deal uh for those interested four-day house arrest like program which is pretty hilarious in this time when everyone's quarantined and has to stay at home anyway a 90-day outpatient treatment 48 hours of community service and one year of probation and the most important one that everybody was curious about uh, people were thinking whether he goes to jail or not no jail time no jail time whatsoever and i'm one of those people like i didn't in any way want to see uh the justice system you know really destroy john jones or put the boots to him or see him out of the uc for any extended period of time or see him stripped anything like that um at the same time i do feel like this is the kind of slap on the wrist that is somewhat enabling to someone like john jones who's obviously going through a lot of things and has a lot of personal issues and the message to him in a way is look you you made another mistake yet again very serious no real consequences and i feel like somebody like john jones probably won't really get the message that he so desperately needs he's had many brushes with the law now but just i i don't think this is the story i think the story more more so is what he's actually going through personally on a personal level you know on a deep level so i'm just wondering when you saw the news that john jones was once again arrested you know what what was your reaction to this whole thing 
you know, at first it's like, come on, man, John, not again. You know, it really was just disappointment almost. I mean, the guy is the greatest fighter in in the history of the sport. And, uh, man, to, to have him, you know, continue to have these troubles, at first it was just like, oh, man, not again. And then when you start to read the details of it, um, you know, listen, John Jones going out and getting drunk, far be it for me to, to, to judge anybody for using <laughs> a bit too much alcohol, all right? Mm. Um, you know, drunk driving, I mean, he wasn't actually operating the motor vehicle, but – the vehicle was running, and he admitted he had been driving and intended on doing it again. Drunk driving, uh, certainly, certainly something to be avoided at all costs, um, especially when you're a man of, of John's wealth. You know, he does have a driver on, on staff. Um, at the very least, he could take an Uber. Um, but, you know, I, 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 think that, I think that in itself, you know, tells you something that, you know, it's not a cost issue. It's not, a, it's not like he doesn't know. Mm. Um, he wanted to be out. He wanted to be by himself. The troubling thing to me was, was the firearm. And I'm a little disappointed, I think, with the New Mexico police that it sounds like, you know, um, there's not much, much of an investigation into the firearm or, or at least the charges are being dropped in favor of the, of the DUI. And, I mean, I get it, man. Plea bargains are made all the time. Again, we don't know if he fired it. He, he, he you know, it was a gunshot that that drew the officer's attention to the area to begin with. Um, and, and from what I understand in the investigation, there was a spent shell casing outside of the vehicle. I mean, if, if John Jones is intoxicated now, I watched the video. I mean, he, it definitely seemed like he'd had a couple drinks. He didn't seem completely out of his mind, but he did legally test, you know, twice over the limit. Um, so he was intoxicated by the letter of the law. But if, if he's intoxicated and firing off firearms, man, that is that is scary stuff, dude. You know, for the the the, the safety of others and, and the safety of himself, for that matter. So um, to me. I was disappointed to hear it, but it seems to me like there's more at play here. You know, I think the the initial thing is, oh, John Jones was out partying again, just getting his mm. rage on, and then and that doesn't seem like what it was to me, man. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's one o'clock in the morning, and he's had too much to drink, and he's pulled over talking to a couple homeless people. Like, I mean, God bless you trying to go, you know, minister to the homeless or whatever. Like, I think it is cool that you're treating them like normal people. Like, they are normal people. They're just people that have had bad luck, you know, or, or made bad decisions or whatever. They're still human beings. And kudos to you for, for, for treating them that way. But you're also a, a, a very famous, very wealthy figure uh, who is readily known in the community who is, you know, in, in the middle of the night interacting with those people might not have your best interest at heart. You know what I mean? And so mm. I don't know. It, it seems like maybe, I don't know if depression is the right word or, or something, you know, you know, John, for John to feel that, I mean, if he wanted to get hammered, I mean, he, he's got a very nice residence in Albuquerque yeah. that I'm sure he can, you know, purchase as much high end alcohol as he wants, even though we're all supposed to be social distancing. I'm sure he can have some friends over. They could have a good what I mean, whatever. The fact that he felt the need to be out at one o'clock in the morning talking to these people on the street. I don't know, man. To me, it's it's you know, we always say, oh, I hope he gets the help he deserves. You know, I hope he gets the help that he needs. And I think people kind of mean it. But I think what I haven't always thought that people know is, is or at least to me, is that. You know, what they meant when they said that was, you know, substance addiction. And, and I'm not saying he's not an addict, um, but it seems like if, if we're talking about the help that John Jones needs, it isn't just with substance abuse. It seems like there's some deeper issues there. So um, I, I don't know, man. It's unfortunate and it sucks uh, because I think John Jones, you know, despite doing some pretty crappy things sometimes, isn't a bad dude. Mm. And, he is, and he is unquestionably an incredible athlete. So um, I don't know, man. It's it's we say it every time. Hopefully, this is the one that that, that helps him. But hopefully, this is the one that that helps him, man. He's got a family, and man, you could hear, you know, in that in that tape, you can hear him get kind of emotion and thinking about his family when he was getting, you know, put in the back of a cop car, and and that just sucks, man. I mean, uh, I know he doesn't want to let people down, so I I just hope for better things for John Jones, man. I, I really do. Mm. Uh, DC was speaking to Ariel Hawani, and he said that. I don't think the UFC should cut him. I think the UFC needs to save him. And that was a pretty powerful statement. What do you think would happen to a John Jones if the UFC just gave up on him at this point? It sucks, man. I, I, I do agree with that sentiment. I don't see any reason to strip him. I don't see any reason to cut him. I don't know that the UFC can save him. Um, you know, one thing I do know about substance abuse is you can't make anybody stop. You know what I mean? If they, they, they've got to want to stop. They've got to want to not do that. And, and, and from my understanding, you know, I know a lot of times – the people around him get accused of just being yes men and hangers on. But I've had some conversations behind the scenes with some of his team that have said, man, of course we've talked to him about this stuff. You know, of course we we, 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 we try to give him the best advice we possibly can. We, we, we want the best in the world for him. And, you know, um, I, I don't know that if he went anywhere else that, that necessarily anything would change. You know, I think, you know, in fact, 
hell, USC giving up on him or anybody else giving up on him might just give him one more reason to, to kind of have a chip on his shoulder and to have a feeling like it's me against the world and, you know, nobody's got my back and nobody's here for me. So it's a weird situation because the UFC can't do anything for John that John doesn't want to do for himself. Um, mm. But, I, I, you know, I, I would like to know that they're there to support him. And from my understanding, they always have been. And, you know, the, the people behind the UFC, I mean, you know, Dana White, uh, you know, Hunter, the rest of the crew there. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes they can be a little rough around the edges, but behind the scenes, I know they handle things a lot differently than they do in public. Um, and and, and I, I know they'll try to get John, you know, all the help that he needs. I mean, fortunately, he's a wealthy man. Um, he has the, the, the resources to to obtain any kind of assistance he needs. Um, but it's it's got to come from within, man. You know, you and, and that's that's what I think's got to got to be dealt. There's so many times, you know, in life, especially with substance abuse, it's not just about the substance abuse. You know, there's usually some kind of underlying um, emotional, psychological c- condition, whatever it may be. And I think, uh, to me, and again, I'm no psychologist. I'm you know, I'm I'm just a, a you know, a mixed martial arts journalist. But to me, it seems like there's got to be something else going on with John. The guy literally has everything in the mm. world, man. He's the baddest dude on the planet, revered as the greatest of all time in a sport. I mean, at worst, you could argue he's what the second or third best ever, and that's like. That's probably if you just don't like the guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, he's the greatest of all time. He's 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 got money. Uh, he's got fame. He's he's. I mean, he literally beats other people up for a living. Like you know, it's like he's got everything. And and uh, but he, he's missing something. You know what I mean? He's missing something that he's going out and chasing with with alcohol in the middle of the night. And um, he's looking for some kind of fulfillment there. And and I think um, that's really what needs to be addressed. This you know, this was not a situation of. Uh, you know, John Jones was at some crazy party with a bunch of strippers and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's not mm. what it was, you know. So, uh, man, it's uh, ho- hopefully th- he can he can get, you know, get going in the right direction. Mm. And it's crazy because the man has such a good poker face that sometimes, you know, he's cutting a promo about, you know, everything going well. And other times he's cutting a promo about, you know, sort of building up heat towards a fight. So I, ne- I never feel- felt like any one of us really ever saw the real John Jones or at least got a chance to really get a chat- chance to speak to him about what's really going on. But the WWE, they have a wellness program for their athletes. Do you think it's a- it might be time for the UFC to look into possibly doing something around that, especially with CTE, um, drug and alcohol abuse issues for-, for past fighters or guys on the roster sort of coming towards the end of their career? That's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, you know, one thing I don't, I'll have to admit because I don't follow wrestling a lot. I'm get. I mean, I, I, I don't, are those independent contractors or those employees? I, I don't know. Do, do you know? I think that they're independent contractors uh, still in the WWE. I believe, yeah, they are. Um, but they do have a guarantee pays um, and they do, I believe, have some health coverage. Andrew, yes, that, that's this. what I was yeah. That, yeah. that was that was what my question was going to be because I don't know if you know like a, a wellness program or whatever how that works between employees and and uh, and contract labor and that sort of thing so I don't know but I, I like the idea of it man I, I really do like the idea of it I mean these are things that that you know you could collectively bargain for if everybody would come together I mean look I've been covering the sport for long enough that uh, I I don't really have a lot of hope for for fighters creating a union uh, or an association. I mean, they've had many, many opportunities to do it. And it's difficult. You know, not everybody's on the same page. And, you know, if, if Conor McGregor's not involved, you know, how do you get everybody in in a union that if, if that guy's not involved? You know, before it was George St. Pierre, you know, if, if you don't have those top level people involved, I, I don't know how you get everybody involved, but, you know, they don't necessarily have the same needs. And so it's tough to get everybody on the same page. It's It's not easy. I mean, look at the Mixed Martial Arts Journalists Association, man. I mean, no, no disrespect, but I, I mean, uh, what 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 has that done what what has it you know generated what has it been able to do i don't know so i mean i see journalists all the time writing about how important unions and associations are and how they can't believe that fighters don't get together to do it but it hasn't it hasn't been done with us either so um you know i i think it's just hard to get everybody on the same page and have everybody's interests align but but i, I do love the idea man i really do um man you know fighting obviously uh you know, so much of what these fighters put themselves through physically. I mean, their bodies obviously need it. And it's great that we have the performance center. Uh, it's, it's great that, um, you know, the, the, the programs that they do have in place, but anything that can be an added benefit. I love it. And, uh, and again, you know, mentally, uh, mentally, man, this is a, this is a very difficult sport. I think that's one of the things, honestly, that's always 
attracted me to the sport from the very beginning is not just the physical prowess that these athletes have. I mean, what, what they do is incredible, the training they put in, what they do to go out there and fight, but the mentality of, of what they have. I mean, first of all, to be just to lock yourself into a cage with another human being hell-bent on, on doing physical damage to you, I mean, that's tough, you know what I mean? But but then, man, the, the way the world is now, I mean, look, you don't win or lose as a team. I mean, you, we, we, we say it's, it's the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and that's cool, but it's the really the lowest of lows, man. You lose – and you just got your ass kicked in front of thousands of people and millions, you know, watching on TV and, you know, your phone's not ringing for the interviews and, you know, you're not getting all the text messages and the direct messages and everybody reaching out to you, you know, now all of a sudden your, your phone's not ringing and, and it's not like a, a team sport where you get to go back out there the next day, like, oh, that broke my heart, but we'll get them tomorrow. Mm. No, nah, man, you got to wait three months, four months, six months to rectify all that. I mean, just, ah. Oh, Mentally, it's a it's a tough spot out there, and um, yeah, man, any any kind of added benefit that the UFC could do, um, I, I would I would love to see. I would love to see. Mm, really, really good points there, uh, made John. We'll let you go uh, on this one. Just one more thing. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I'm just wondering: are you are you like me? Are you sort of glad that this body cam footage was released of John Jones? Because I feel like it was very eye opening, and I feel like like you mentioned before, it's hard to pity someone when you the perception is that oh, John Jones is out there having a great time, just living a life that none of us could ever experience but seeing this body cam footage you think like this is not a guy that's living in a world that isn't accessible to us this is a guy that's like you mentioned struggling with some deep deep issues and i was talking to our good buddy oscar willis from the mac life the other day and we were saying like i said look is it a case like you know with uh tyson fury where you know he had this dream of becoming the heavyweight champion he did it and then he didn't know what to do with himself and oscar said no look that's something that he had since he was like a little kid with john jones he sort of had everything come to him with relative ease and i said you know do you think that uh, it's a case where he has everything in life and he's just trying to find the limits and, and test the boundaries? And he said, honestly, John Jones is a very complex and, and layered human being. And I think that's maybe something that some of us didn't really realize uh, for, for a long period of time. I, and now you have these comparisons to almost like a BJ Penn, where if he's not in training camp, if he doesn't have that structure, John McCarthy was talking about it, then he, he, he's just a, 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 a big problem to himself. Yeah, no, I agree, man. I did think the body cam footage was very, very eye-opening, very revealing. First of all, on a lighter note, let me just say, I'm not sure I could have passed those tests that he was being given either, man. Some of the, I didn't understand. I, I couldn't understand what the officer was saying, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut him a little bit of slack mm. there. But, again, he did test tw you know, twice over the legal limit, so, I mean, he certainly was intoxicated. Um, yeah, but, no, I think it was I think it was eye-opening, man. I, again, you know, you, you know, you hear oh, John Jones arrested again, and immediately you think, oh, what was the guy doing? What, what, what was he driving 140 miles an hour in his mm. in his Ferrari down the highway? You know, uh, drinking hands, you know, sniffing rails. I mean, you, you just <laughs> wonder. But, and then mm. you and, and then you see that. You know, you see. Hold on, whoa, 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 we're in the middle of a quarantine, dude. This is, I mean, Albuquerque is already a little bit of a sketchy city, man. I mean, there's some rough <laughs> parts of it. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. now you see he's out there in the middle of the night, you know, talking to people. I think. Looking for some, looking for some type of affirmation, maybe, or just looking for—I I don't know—looking for something. I, I don't know. I don't know what he was looking for, but he's looking for something. He's not out there. Just to me, man, that's not normal behavior, man. No, you don't do that normally. Um, so, so I don't know, man. I, yeah. So in that respect, do I do think it was eye opening? I think for people to see it, it was like, wait a minute, maybe the situation was a little bit different than I thought. It doesn't make it right. And again, the one thing that I still I still am not clear on is not get. I mean. If the dude fired a gun out of his car in the middle of downtown Albuquerque, like that is bad, man. And, mm. and, and he should have firearms taken away from him if that's the case. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't want to paint it out to, oh, poor John, he's the victim here. No, he made some terrible decisions and he has made terrible decisions throughout his career. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's more to it than, you know, he just doesn't care about what the world thinks and he doesn't adhere to the the policies and whatever else. I mean, I, I think there's much more to this case. And like Oscar said, you know, a layered human being, I absolutely believe it. Um, I certainly, in my, you know, I've, I've covered John since uh, his, his UFC debut. I interviewed him uh, before he fought uh, Andre Guzmao back at UFC 87. So I mean, I've literally did, been interviewing him. Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> Literally been interviewing him his entire career, man, and, and we have seen the development. I mean, he was a, he was a kid. He was a mm. kid when he came in, um, and, and he, you know, he's had to deal with this all in front of us. So, again, I, I don't want to paint it out to, oh, poor John Jones. You know, he, he he's really the victim here. No, he made some poor decisions, um, and he needs to make different decisions moving forward. But I think there's much more to the story, and to your point, um, yeah, I think that body cam footage was a little bit eye-opening for people to see, uh, to, to, to understand a little bit more of the situation. Mm. 
Well, John, we appreciate you coming on and uh, bring some brightness into this uh, lockdown lives of ours. Of course, you guys can follow John at MMA Junkie John for all the latest news in UFC 249. And if the man will be there to cover it in person, I would love to see your coverage of that event. It, I, I just feel like it's the right thing to do. I feel like, you know what, forget uh, forget referees. Just put John Morgan somewhere in that octagon for their entire event. And uh, let's just do in between in interviews in between rounds like they do in, in in the nba and some of the sports let's just really really make the most of this since you're going to be there and of course guys i want to thank ridge wallets for supporting us as well a fantastic company jump on the code save 10 percent get yourself a wallet today and we will be back with another episode of submission radio next week <laughs>